You know, when people introduce me, they never remember to mention my most important contribution to human welfare, which is that I introduced Hellman's mayonnaise to Great Britain. <laughs> And my former boss is sitting in the front row here looking very pleased. <laughs> so I may be a rotten speaker, I may be a rotten writer, but you owe me Hellman's mayonnaise. <laughs> now, we're going to take questions at the end, but I'm going to answer the first question before anyone asks it, because I know what it will be. I've not given this lecture before, but I've given similar ones. And the first question is all the same. Dr. Halliday, why did you not mention Thomas Crapper? Well, the reason is that Thomas Crapper was a Victorian businessman who plays but a very small part in our lavatorial history. The word crap, with its present meaning, was in common use in Shakespeare's time and may well appear in the plays of Shakespeare. And it's derived from a medieval French word which means the grain trodden underfoot in the barn and mingled with dust. In other words, rubbish, something you want to get rid of. And the word crap, meaning excrement, has been in use since the reign of Queen Elizabeth I. A perfectly respectable word, not rude at all. And how nice it is to see so many people coming here this evening to listen to me talking about it. <laughs> crap is in fashion. When you go home this evening, you can tell your neighbours, I've been listening to a man talking about crap. And they will say, were you in the strangers' gallery of the House of Commons? <laughs> and you'll say, no, no, this is the real thing. Now, Thomas Crapper opened some showrooms on the King's Road in Chelsea in the 1860s and they were there until 1966. And his contribution to our story is twofold. First of all, he had window displays. Prior to that, water closets and similar uh, equipment had been hidden away. But he had window displays to show off his wares. He also invented the advertising slogan, a certain flush with every pull. Those of us who remember the time when you pulled the chain will recall that if you went to certain rather dodgy flats in Earl's Court in the 1960s, there would be a notice on the door saying, to flush the lavatory, pull quickly three times and slowly once. One, two, three, pull. And then it would flush. Well, they were not Thomas Crappers equipment. If you want to see his water closets and hand basins still in use, they're still to be found in a pub next to platform nine and three quarter, the, the, the Harry Potter flat platform at King's Cross Station. And they're still in very good working order. And on page 100 and, sorry, 101 of the book, there he is, standing outside his showroom in Chelsea. The book will be on sale at the end. I have signed it, and so has Sir Peter Bazalgette, whose name carries a certain resonance in this field. But because we've vandalised them by signing them, the publishers have decided to reduce the price from 19.95 to £15. But if you buy it this evening, you mustn't read it before midnight, because it's not actually being published till tomorrow. <laughs> Now, this is the real hero of our story. This is Sir Joseph Basil Jett. This is what someone wrote about him. You can all read that, I'm sure. Yes? yes, yes. Right. He was appointed in 1856 as chief engineer to the Metropolitan <coughs> Board of Works, which was London's first metropolitan government. Prior to that, London was governed outside the city by parishes whose main aim was to get rid of their rubbish downstream to the next parish. And his job was to build a system of sewers that would clean up the River Thames. When he applied for the job <coughs> of chief engineer, he gave three referees, William Cubitt, 
who was the president of the Institution of Civil Engineers, George, uh, Robert Stevenson, the designer of the rocket, and his third referee was Isambard Kingdom Brunel. <laughs> and I always think that's rather like applying for a job as a parish priest and giving as your referees Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. <laughs> he was of French descent. Uh, his, his grandfather left France in about 1780, probably to escape being conscripted into the French army. Good enough reason. And Joseph's father, also Joseph, was born in England. So why was it necessary for him to do this? Why, why did we need a new system of sewers for London? Incidentally, it, this is his 200th anniversary, born in 1819. I'll take you back to the Times on the 8th of July, 1855. Can you all read that? Yes. Everyone at the back? Yes. The whole of the river was an opaque pale brown fluid. Ere many, year, ere many years are over, a hot season will give us sad proof of the folly of our carelessness. What was significant was the signature, Michael Faraday, at the time probably the most famous scientist in the world. This is what Punch had to say about it the following day, following week. This is Mr. Faraday presenting his card to Father Thames and holding his nose as he does so. And this was the consequence death's dispensary, cholera being dispensed in drinking water by a figure of death. And the result was four cholera epidemics in London which killed nearly 40,000 people. There was a final epidemic in 1892 in Hamburg. Great panic because cholera had always arrived from the continent. Special committee set up to deal with the forthcoming cholera epidemic. By this time, Basil Jett was dead, but there were no deaths because his system was protecting London from foul water. In those days, many people, including Florence Knighting and Edwin Chadwick, believed that cholera was caused by foul air. We now know that it was actually caused by polluted water. But when you think about it, if you're walking around in London and the, the Thames smells terrible and people are dying of cholera and then you go home and drink a glass of water in which you can't actually see any microbes, it's quite reasonable to assume that they're being killed by the smell. This man, Edward Ch Edwin Chadwick, thought the solution to the cholera epidemics was to build a structure like the Eiffel Tower from which by some mysterious and unspecified process, fresh air would be drawn up and down and circulated in the streets of London and get rid of the epidemics. Fortunately, no one took any notice of him. <laughs> then we come to 1858 and the episode that the press called the Great Stink. This is what Hansard had to say about it. This is three years after Faraday's letter. Long, hot summer, not much water in the Thames, which is, of course, tidal, so it never goes away. Disraeli, in a debate, called the Thames that Stygian pool. Eleven days later, this is what the Thames had to say. <clears throat> We are heartily glad of it. They were glad of it because they thought at last someone would do something about it. Bear in mind that these members of parliament thought that they were being poisoned by the smell. They weren't. But they thought they were. So that actually led to them taking some action, which I shall shortly describe. Before I get to that, let's just look at London's network of rivers. Here's the River Thames running through the centre. 
All these little rivers still exist, some of them quite large rivers. The River Fleet, the River Westbourne, the River Wandle to the south, the Ravensbourne. And in the Middle Ages and later, they were used for the purpose which nature intended, which was dispose of rainwater. You were not allowed to put your sewage in the public sewers which were there to conduct rainwater to the rivers. If you needed to spend a penny, you went to a cesspool in the basement of your home. You did what you had to do and when it was full up, night soil men would come along, empty it and cart it off and sell it to farmers. It was a very profitable business. That's why we still talk about sewage farms, though a modern sewage treatment works is more like an oil refinery than a farm. In the reign of Queen Elizabeth I, <clears throat> the sewage was used as a source, source of saltpetre for gunpowder. So we now know that Sir Francis Drake's secret weapon in driving off the armada was exploding excrement. Well, the night Seilman system worked very well until the late 18th century when three things happened. First of all, London grew, so the fields moved further away. Spitalfields, Moorfields were no longer fields. The night Seilman were having to travel further. Secondly, in the 1840s, guano, which is solidified bird droppings began to be imported from South America. It made the family of a, 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 a Victorian family rich enough to build the National Trust property of Tintsfield in Somerset, which one, some of you may have, may have visited. But the real killer was the water closet. Now the water closet was invented by a man called John Harrington in the reign of Queen Elizabeth I, but he only made two, one for himself and one for the Queen. Neither of them survived. In the late 18th century, a Yorkshire carpenter, George Brammer, rediscovered it and realised that you could make it more efficient and make it from mass-produced components. So from the late 18th century, the water closet becomes the must-have item for a Victorian household. It received a further boost at the time of the Great Exhibition in 1851 when an enterprising manufacturer of water closets called George Jennings offered to install his water closets in the Crystal Palace, the pavilion of the Great Exhibition, on condition that he could charge a penny a time which is where we get the expression, spending a penny. Let's look at some of London's rivers. This is the Fleet River on the left, flowing through St Pancras. On the right, more or less as it is now, beneath the Farringdon Road. It enters the, Fleet, the River Thames, close to the site of Blackfriars Station. Here's the Thames, here's the fleet. This is the present site of Blackfriars Station. This is the present site of Unilever House next to the, city, the old City of London School. If you stand on the platforms of Blackfriars Station, stretching out over the Thames and look down at low tide, you can still see the River Fleet emptying its contents into the... River Thames. Now, as I mentioned earlier, the River Thames is a tidal river. So if someone has cholera and his germs find their way into a sewer and a river and the Thames, at high tide, instead of the rivers and the wells flowing into the Thames, the Thames backs up into them. So the whole of London is at risk. This is Bazalgette's system to deal with the problem. Oh, oh, let's have a look at the Knight's Bridge first. This is the Knight's Bridge. 
River Westbourne, which rises on Hampstead Heath, Hampstead Heath. You see it as the Serpentine in Hyde Park. It flows in a metal culvert, culvert across a platform at Sloan Square and enters the Thames near Chelsea. You may re recognise these buildings. This is Harrods. <laughs> and this is Harvey Nichols here, you see. Now, this is Bazalgette's system for collecting London sewage and delivering it to treatment works in Beckton and Crossness. Here's the River Thames again. These thick black lines are the system of intercepting sewers that he built, starting in the west, getting gradually larger as they pick up more and more sewage, constructed to take maximum advantage of gravity with, pu with pumping stations where absolutely necessary and, uh, in effect, protect the River Thames from the sewage. That was the system he pr proposed, but first he had to convince this man, Big Ben, Sir Benjamin Hall, who was the, uh, the, governor, the government's commissioner of works, who had to ap approve the system. Now, the Houses of Parliament had been burned down in 1834, and he was getting them rebuilt. And he wanted to be sure that Bazalgette's system would take the sewage sufficiently far downstream for it not to come back to Westminster on a really high tide. He didn't want to go down in history as the man who brought about another great stink after spending a lot of money. And he, what do you do when you're a politician and you can't make up your mind? You engage consultants. So he engaged some consultants, and the consultants said, well, to be absolutely sure, you need to take Bazalgette system another 10 miles downstream. So Bazalgette said, yes, I can do that, and this is what it will cost. There was then a debate, as there always is, about who would pay for it. The London members of Parliament maintained that it was an imperial matter and should be paid for by the entire kingdom and the empire. You can imagine how well that went down in Scotland. <laughs> so that was kicked into touch. There was another plan, a truly cunning plan, by a man called Thomas Ellis, who was an Irish solicitor, and he said, why don't we pump all the sewage to the top of Hampstead Heath and let it flow off in every direction? <laughs> now, Hampstead Heath is where Polly Toynbee lives. Bill Oddy, Melvin Bragg, I bet they wouldn't be living there now if Thomas Ellis had had his way. And then came the great stink. And members of Parliament were terrified that they were being killed. And so they agreed. They passed an act in 10 days, introduced by Benjamin Disraeli, uh, that Basil Jett should go ahead and do what he thought was best. And this is what he did. He started work in January 1859. In 1865, the Southern Treatment Works was opened by the Prince of Wales. That's at Cross Ness near Abbey Wood, and they have open days. It's been restored by a group of enthusiasts, and it's a magnificent example of Victorian engineering and ironwork. And when they have an open day, if you go, you will not be disappointed, I promise you. In 1866, there was the last epidemic in Whitechapel when over 5,000 people were killed in one square mile because the northern part of the city was not yet protected by Bazalgette's system. As from 1868, it was. And so in 1892, we had the cholera epidemic that didn't happen. The system worked. Let's just look at some of the engineering involved. 82 miles of new intercepting sewers, those were the thick black lines, which in parts are larger than the underground train tunnels. 165 miles of reconstructed sewers to connect with them. 1,100 miles of new street sewers. 
four pumping stations, 318 million bricks. That's enough to house the population of Portsmouth, I am told by my friend who is a bricklayer. <laughs> he used 80,000 cubic yards of concrete and three and a half million cubic yards of earth were excavated to be used in building the embankments. London was a very busy place at this time because the underground railway was also being built. So London was being thoroughly dug up. This is the, what, what is called the outfall sewer that runs from the pumping station at Abbey Mills in West Ham to Beckton, Barking, where the treatment works is. In order to build it, they had to, first of all, build a concrete works, then a railway to take the concrete to where it was wanted at Ab Abbey Mills. Then they built the sewer. As the sewer re advanced, the railway retreated until they got all the way to Barking and the treatment works, and then they dismantled the whole lot, the railway and the concrete works, and took them somewhere else. A massive engineering task. They had to raise some roads and lower some railways to enable them to build just this three miles of sewer so that they could have a steady gradient. This is the pumping station at Abbey Mills. It was described as a Moorish extravagance at the time. It does look have a sort of ecclesiastical look about it. These two chimneys were demolished in the Second World War because it was feared that the chimneys were being used as the, by the Luftwaffe as a, an, a navigational device. And in fact, when... Bazalgette was building the system, there was some speculation in the press about whether the sewers would make us vulnerable to invasion. The argument being <clears throat> that an enemy could stop off at the treatment works, bung them up and flood London with its own sewage. And someone wrote to the Times saying, on the contrary, the sewage of London suddenly released upon an advancing fleet would cause panic or death by poison. Fortunately, they didn't need to do that. This is some of the Victorian ironwork. This is from the um, uh, Illustrated London News, by, by the way. This does not give due justice to it because this is coloured in every colour of the rainbow. The Victorians were very proud of their great works, even when no one saw them. Because, remember... You have a job to find these pumping stations and treatment works because they're in uninhabited areas even now. Let's look at some of the system in use today. Uh, here is a, a case where they've cut off the flow so that this man can check the brickwork and see that it's all in good working order. Now, when Bazalgette retired, he left behind a system whereby the sewage was taken to Beckton or Crossness. The water was run off and released into the Thames. And the solids, if I may call them that, were loaded onto sludge boats. One of them was called the Sir Joseph Basil Jet and dumped in the North Sea. And that arrangement that he created in the 1870s and 80s remained in use until 1998 when this system was used to replace it. First of all, the sewage is placed in a settling tank. The water is run off, the liquid is run off, and is pumped form full of microbes and oxygen whose idea of a good feed is what we send round the S-band. The solids, which of course still got a lot of liquid in them, are pumped into these things, which are like huge concertinas. They are then squeezed, more liquid is taken out, subjected to more prolonged treatment, and the solids 
are then pumped into incinerators. Human sewage contains a lot of methane, so if you can raise the temperature high enough, it burns quite merrily and creates electricity, which is fed into the national grid. And the residue, the ash, is used to build, to make breeze blocks. So next time you see some breeze blocks, <laughs> a modern sewage treatment works is a very clever collection of physics, chemistry, and biology. And a modern sewage treatment works is based upon the assumption that if something can be eaten, something can be found to eat it. And that's what happens. Some microbes thrive in an oxygen-rich environment, so they pump oxygen into the liquid. Some thrive in an oxygen-free environment, so they boil it and get rid of all the oxygen. And a modern sewage treatment works. If you ever visit one, it starts off a very murky liquid. They start by removing physical objects like tampons and wet wipes and the occasional motorbike. <coughs> Those they incinerate. And then they subject it, first of all, to oxygen-free treatment. Then they boil it. Then they subject it, subject it to oxygen-rich treatment. And you can see the liquid getting clearer and clearer as it emerges from each process. And when the, the sewage is as clean as or cleaner than the water in the River Thames, then they release it to the river. And the same is true in, in Cambridge, where I live, um, where the sewage is released to the, to the River Cam. Now, the observe said, every penny spent is spent in a good cause. From Marylebone Mercury to, to Mr. Basil Jett, no tribute of praise can be undeserved. Structural work that is the admiration of all who see it. You don't see, hear people saying that about motorways, do you? Or indeed crossrail. Here's um, an account of Basil Jett's other works. The Victoria, Albert and Chelsea Embankment many streets in London, river crossings, parks, and he also designed systems for other communities. One was Budapest. He designed the system for Budapest. And one was for Cambridge, where I live. So he was a very busy man, his services in great demand. Let's just look at each of those. This is the Victoria Embankment, which runs from Westminster Bridge to Blackfriars Bridge. It reclaimed 37 acres from the Thames, to accommodate the low-level sewer, the district and circle line, which was being built at the time, it was called the District Railway, and a tunnel for gas, water, and electricity. And it was opened on the 13th of July, 1870. It was supposed to be opened by Queen Victoria, but she had one of her infamous headaches and sent her son, so it was opened instead by the future Edward VII. Here's an idea of the scale of the task. This is the present site of Charing Cross Station. Here's the district railway, now the district and circle line. Here's the low-level sewer. Here is the service tunnel for gas and water pipes. Here is the River Thames. That's from the Illustrated London News. This shows the embankment being constructed. There's Somerset House. You build two jetties and a key. You pump out the water. You then bring in spoil on barges, spoil that you've generated elsewhere or that the underground railway builders have generated. So you fill this in. You then bring down granite from Cornwall or Aberdeen to line the embankment wall. You then take this lot down and move further downstream. At any one time, 10,000 people were working on this project. 
Here is the opening of the Victoria Embankment, a grand occasion. Here's Somerset House, which, remember, used to be sitting in the River Thames. Here is Victoria Embankment Gardens, which illustrates the size of the operation better than any other. You can perhaps just see here York Gate at the bottom of Buckingham Street, I think it is. That's where the Dukes of Buckingham and York used to, st to step onto their boats, here. And now here's the River Thames. So all this has been reclaimed from the river. It's about 100 yards. And Gladstone wanted to reclaim it for the crown and build offices on it, let them out and abolish income tax. But W.H. Smith, when he wasn't selling newspapers, was a campaigner and he argued that London badly needed a green space in this part of London. So it survived. Uh, one of the consequences of building this, of course, was that it narrowed the river. That's why it no longer freezes. It's not because of global warming. It's because it's much narrower and flows much more quickly, even in the coldest winters. He also built the Albert Embankment for Geoffrey Archer's uh, penthouse and some other well-known London landmarks. This is James Bond's office. You may remember that in 2000, the 20th of September 2000, there was a rocket attack, supposedly by the IRA, on the MI6 headquarters. Do you remember that? <clears throat> I can now reveal, between ourselves, that the rocket was actually fired from Conservative Central Office at Geoffrey Archer's penthouse. <laughs> and it veered off course, but don't mention that to anyone. <laughs> Does anyone recognise that? It's St Thomas's Hospital, also built on land reclaimed from the Thames by Sir Joseph Basil Jett. And then he built the um, Chelsea Embankment in 1874, again to accommodate the low-level sewer, at which point he was knighted and became Sir Joseph. Just an idea of the con cost. The cost of the main drainage was £4.2 million. Remember that figure because I'll refer to it later. Other works, including the embankments, cost £14 million. That's mostly cost of building streets and compensating the owners for the, the demolition of their properties. Cut and cover, dig a trench, build a sewer, cover it over, only where it was less than 30 feet below the surface and you need a minimum fall of two feet per mile for sewage to flow evenly. Where it was deeper than that, they tunnelled. He drew up the detailed plans and the con contractors executed them, for example, um, on quality control of materials. He was the first person to make major use of Portland cement in a construction project because Portland cement had a bad reputation for unreliability. But it's very good if it's going to have water running through it because it actually gets stronger. So he instituted a really draconian quality control regime on site. He tested every consignment to destruction and if it didn't come up to scratch, he sent it back. So the Portland cement suppliers realised that supplying Basil Jet with dodgy cement was not a good idea, set up their own, own quality control on site. It got a good reputation and it's now, even now, still in universal use. Here are some new streets that he built. The Duke of Northumberland, who used to have the last of the great palaces facing Trafalgar Square, he was paid off with £400,000 
and 40,000 people were rehoused when some of the, the uh, Charing Cross Road, the top of Charing Cross Road around Tottenham Court uh, Road Station, for example, was an appalling slum. They were, uh, they were um, demolished and replaced. He demolished and replaced Putney Bridge. He demolished and replaced Battersea Bridge. Hammersmith Bridge was substantially reconstructed. It was in a poor condition, and when he rebuilt it, it lasted 120 years. It's worth noting that he built it to accommodate horses and carts, and for over 100 years, it's been carrying double-decker buses and HGVs before they had to close it again. The nearby Hammersmith flyover lasted 30 years. Victorian engineers were very often using techniques and materials that were new, so they were very, very cautious. They worked out what they felt they needed, doubled it, added a bit for luck, and then built. And it's just as well for us that they did. He also proposed the Blackwell Tunnel, the Woolwich Free Ferry. They were proposed and designed, though um, they were not opened until after he retired. Here's Hammersmith Bridge as it was. Here's the gate through which you went on your horse, turnstiles through which you walked, and you can see it's much narrower uh, than, than it is now. So that was very substantially reconstructed to the bridge that we now know. Now, in 1878, he proposed to build what we now call Tower Bridge. City fathers said they didn't think there was any need for one. St. Olive's Parish on the south side said it would have a prejudicial effect on the value of a large amount of property in the parish. Not in my backyard. We don't want all that East End riffraff coming, coming across to see us. Well, it was built. Bazalgette himself submitted a design, not the one that was uh, chosen. This is the original Tower Bridge, as it was to be. Uh, and, and, and it's the Bascule Bridge. Whoops. The Bascule Bridge that we, we all remember, sorry, that we all uh, remember. But they were going to have this arch, but the, 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 the Metropolitan Board of Works, the London County Council had taken over from them, said, well, can you make it a bit prettier? So we ended up with a bridge that we all now know and love. It's actually quite an advanced piece of, piece of engineering, a steel-framed building, but they wanted to, to, it to look medieval so that it wouldn't look too out of focus with the Tower of London. So the brickwork and the stonework, you see, is basically facing. So why was he forgotten for so long? Um, <clears throat> I persuaded the business school, where I was giving lectures on marketing, that they should sponsor me to do a PhD part-time on Sir Joseph Bazalgette and the Main Drainage of London. And that PhD became a book, which was published 20 years ago, and um, it immediately became a bestseller, and it's remained so ever since, I'm pleased to say, the great stink of London. But why was he not better known? Why did no one write about him until 110 years after his death? Well, I think I know the reason. He left no personal papers, so I had to go back to newspapers, debates in Parliament, Hansard, reports of the Metropolitan Board of Works, his own records. It was hard work, but very interesting and enjoyable. Much better than teaching students, I can tell you. <laughs> and most of his work is invisible. The sewers are invisible. You don't see them. You don't see the treatment works unless you go looking for them. Roads are invisible. You just think that they happen when someone puts up buildings on either side. He had to build those thoroughfares by demolishing huge quantities of property in order to make way for them, but people didn't realise that. You don't notice the embankments. When I first gave this lecture 20 years ago, a gentleman who was in the audience and whom I knew to be a judge in one of the inns of court the Middle Temple, in fact, approached me afterwards and he said, do you know, Stephen, I've had an office overlooking the Victoria Embankment for 20 years and it had never occurred to me that anyone had to build it. 
it looks as if it's always been there. And if you stand outside Shakespeare's globe at low tide and look across the river at these huge granite walls, like a medieval fortification, you get some idea of the sheer scale and ingenuity of the work. And, of course, you don't really see parks. Uh, Southwark Park was one of the parks he created, and he also cleaned up Blackheath. So it very quickly became an interesting subject, made into lots of television and radio programs, featured in newspapers. And, but the thing of which I'm most proud occurred when I was at work. One of my students stopped me in the corridor and said, have you written a book, Stephen, about London sewers? Yes. He said, um, it was on Blue Peter. <laughs> so I said, well, what was it doing there? So he said, well, Blue Peter went down into the sewers, which is the sort of thing they did and still do. And they read from this book, The Great Stink of London, by Dr. Stephen Halliday about what London used to be like before it had sewers and what it's like now. But he said, I didn't think it could be you. <laughs> so I said, why not? He said, well, I didn't know you were a doctor. I said, I'm not a proper doctor, you know, I can't make you better. He said, um, I didn't know you'd written a book. And anyway, he said, I didn't think you were that clever. <laughs> so, so faced with this, with this vote of confidence, I wrote to Blue Peter. It has been drawn to my attention. I think I deserve a badge. <laughs> and here it is. Now, this was the verdict on Basil Jett's career the day after he died in March 1891. I think the last sentence is the most important. Of the great sewer that runs beneath, London has no, as a rule, nothing. Though the Registrar General could tell them that its existence has added 20 years to their chance of life. There was a huge increase in human health and longevity during the 19th century. Very little of it was down to medicine. In those days, all doctors could do was put you to bed with a warm drink or cut bits off you and hope you didn't die in the process. But engineers, by providing clean water, could do a great deal. And that's what Basil Jett was doing. Now, the, the story doesn't end there. I'm going to bring it right up to date to the Thames Tideway Tunnel. Most drainage systems have separate pipes for wastewater and rainwater. Wastewater, lavatories, washing machines, baths, dishwashers, and so on. A combined system deals with wastewater and rainwater. Now, it's easy to predict the flow of wastewater. Whoops, sorry. You know when people are going to be up and about. You know when offices are going to be open. You could even predict when they're going to be taking showers in the morning or evening. Rainwater is impossible to predict. If you have a separate system for rainwater, it doesn't matter if it overflows into rivers. But Basil Jett, in effect, said, if you make me build two different systems for London, the biggest city in the world, I'm going to have to dig up London twice. Is that a good idea? So they agreed that he'd have a combined system for wastewater and rainwater, but they recognised that there would be occasions when the, the mixture of rainwater and wastewater would have to overflow into the Thames. And London has actually 57 combined sewer overflows where you, so that you can re release the rainwater, of course, mixed with some sewage at times of heavy rainfall. Basil Jett reckoned this would happen 12 times a year, but it now happens 60 times a year. Now, why is that? 
Well, he provided for a population of four million. In his day, there were two and a half million. But he built the system so it could be expanded to four million. And in fact, it's been expanded to accommodate the present nine million. And it's predicted 13 million, sorry, by 2030. Now, so there are more of us producing sewage. If rain falls on a field or a meadow or your lawn, much of it settles on the foliage, some of it will evaporate, some will be taken up by the roots, and the rest slowly flows away into under, underground sewers and rivers. If you put up more buildings, if, for example, you turn your front lawn into hard standing for your car, the water runs away immediately. So you get a much more sudden onrush. We're also getting a more frequent occurrence of storms, really heavy periods of rain. You can argue whether it's down to global warming or believe that it's due to some mysterious and um, unspecified process, like the President of the United States. <clears throat> but it happens. So it's now reckoned that 39 million tonnes of overflow are making their way into the Thames every year. So the Thames super sewer is being built. It will run from 16 miles from Acton in the west to Beckton, the sewage treatment works on the north bank near Barking. There'll be a separate branch from Abbey Mills pumping station to Beckton, which I believe is already in use, actually. It will be 7.2 metres in diameter. That's twice the size of the tube railways, the northern line, central line, and so on. It will be between 30 and 70 metres beneath the river. And it collects these from the combined sewer overflows flows, and six huge pumps lift it to the Beckton Sewage Treatment Works. And it's estimated that it will cost 4.2 billion pounds, i.e. a thousand times the cost of Bazalgette's work. Now, interestingly, it's very difficult to compare Victorian prices with our own prices. Because if you want to know how, how much of a how much a computer cost in Victorian England, you're in trouble. But some things don't change very much. And one <clears throat> is the wages and the work of a bricklayer. A bricklayer is a skilled tradesman. And the way he works now is more or less the same as it was in Basil Jett's time, except on very high buildings where he's helped by hoists. It's basically a man with a trowel and a hod and some cement. Now, in Basil Jett's time, a skilled bricklayer working a five and a half or six day week would have earned a little over a pound a week at a time when he could rent a house for sixpence or a shilling, 5p or 10p. So he was a well-paid man, a pound a week. I asked my friend Eddie the bricklayer how much he would earn if he was earning five and a half or six days a week and not having holidays, and he said that would be overtime, much of it. He said about a thousand pounds a week. So it's very close. This is costing a thousand times what Basil Jet's work cost. Now the tunnel boring began in November 1918, it is estimated that it will be completed by 2023, um, at which point the, the new sewer overflow will be large enough to absorb any heavy storms which cause sewage to be emptied into the, into the river. Now, um, I hope I've whetted your appetite for sewage. The book that is on sale outside is being published tomorrow, but it's actually a history of sewers and sewage from Babylon to the Thames Tideway Tunnel, explaining how the need for sewers arose as soon as we started living in cities and towns. 
and producing large quantities of the sun, explaining some of the techniques and above all the fascinating way in which a sewage treatment works, uh, uh, operates. Um, I've signed them all. Peter Bazalgette, whose name has a certain resonance in this field, has signed them all. And because we've vandalised them in that way, we've reduced the price from 19.95 to £15. But you mustn't read it before midnight. <laughs> Unless you've got the Chinese edition, which is already available in China, and I know it is because I've been paid for it. <laughs> and publishers do not part with money until they've got it themselves. So there you are. That gives us exactly 10 minutes for questions, I think, if anyone's got any.